Testing. Ready? Okay. Okay. So, Tina Matina Usufa Fini Talofa Maaloho Mai Kako. My name is Tapu, and I am one of the board of directors for the Hawaii LGBT Legacy Foundation. Um, I just want to welcome you folks for being here. I know we've been missing community and missing kind of like that physical in person but I also know that we have people tuning in virtually on Zoom. So I'm thankful for people um, building community, whether in person and virtual. Um, the Rainbow, this Rainbow Town Hall is part of a larger series. And so we have one coming up next, uh, actually this Sunday, and it um, explores the intersection of what it means to be queer and spiritual. And so we hope that you tune in. That one's gonna be completely virtual. So you can find that information um, at our website at honoluluprai.com. So, you know, we wanted to do this Rainbow Town Hall series um, <clears throat> just to have this community input, have community engagement, and it really isn't supposed to just be a only in October kind of thing. So it's part of our larger effort to do Pride 365 days a year. And so we're going to have more of these Rainbow Town Halls, we're going to have more of these community events, and we hope that you, your friends, and your loved ones join us. Some, so some quick housekeeping. <clears throat> Um, for those who are tuning in virtually, we are on site at Vi Vi Collective. And at around 7.45 p.m., we're going to have um, those tuning in virtually or in person to ask our panelists questions. So before we begin, I would like to highlight an, an important sponsor. It's the King Kamehameha Fifth Judiciary History Center, located at Ali'i Olani Hale. And they have served as a bridge between Hawaii's judiciary and the public carrying out its mission to interpret and educate the public about the judicial process and about Hawaii's history. We like to, while the remarks shared today don't necessarily reflect the opinions of the judiciary or the Hawaii LGBT Legacy Foundation, we'd like to thank the Hawaii State Judiciary and the legislator for their continued support of this mission. Today, we have an amazing lineup of fierce advocates for the community and our musical guest is no exception. Isaac has been singing since four years old and credits his musical influences to artists like Mariah Carey, 
Beyonce and Frank Ocean. He's an award-winning performer who has toured locally, national, nationally, and internationally. For those on Zoom and in person, sit back and relax. Isaac will bless us with a few songs, which will help activate this space. And then we'll turn it over to our panelists. Isaac. Mahalo. <laughs> This is a song I wrote uh, about the full moon in June. It's called The Strawberry Moon. Let's do this for Millie over here. She requested this one. next song I'm going to do is a song of my first album. It's called Rocks. I wrote this song uh, when I was back home on uh, Molokai, sitting at the wharf in Kaunagakai, looking out at the sunset and the water reflecting right in front of Lanai. 
there was this big boulder in the middle of it all, and I just was really jealous that this boulder just gets to sit there and watch all these beautiful sunsets for who knows how long. So I wrote this song, tried to write it from the rock's perspective, and then ended up turning it into like a parable on how we can be strong throughout all the storms in life that we face and how we can continue on in our second lives.
the show last night and next door and I blew my voice out. So I'm like, thank God this brass is working with me tonight because it's pretty ugly sometimes. Uh, so this is my last song. It's a song called Recreation. It's on my second album. Uh, my whole family is for having this album, by the way, if you want to shoot your music, it's out there. Um, I wrote this song in 2015. Uh, this is in Coconut Beach, Mattel, for some songwriters and tree men. Uh, they're on the first time that um, the uh, Bob and Bear protest started. And I had a bunch of friends that were, were from Kona, so they were up there. And um, this was kind of before it became like a really huge movement. And I didn't really know much about my own heritage at the point. So I was kind of got curious about you know, why the Bob and Bear so to us. Anyway, long story short, um, I ended up writing this song. Kind of a simultaneous telling of the creation story of Pele and Shia and her sisters coming from the Philippines, making that journey all the way so far just to find life for Pele. They take you to each island of the whole, and they finally end up in Pele um, over the Lake Island. Um, but the song is also about my friends that I love from Kona in protecting and protesting the desecration. Um, so, a lot of people think it's a love song. When I say um, you and I went so far for life, I'm talking about Pele. And when I say I need you to draw closer to me, it's a call back to um, the direct translation of Hi'iake Kapolio Pele, which means to be held close in the bosom of Pele. So I try to kind of put it under the guise of a love song, but this is really, for me, it's a, a song where I celebrate my heritage and um, how I came into my own understanding of it.
Testing. Okay. So thank you so much, Isaac, for really setting the tone of tonight. It was truly a blessing to hear you sing and to be part of this panel. So for context, this event is, in, um, is entitled How to Start a Movement. And the reason why we wanted to have this event is because I think oftentimes we think that we can take whatever's happening on the continent and duplicate it and then bring it here. Yeah, but pride necessarily must be place-based. And I say that because whatever happens on the continent doesn't necessarily uplift and empower us. And so it's important if we're gonna talk about movements, if we're gonna talk about community building, that it has to be rooted to the people, to the community and to the history here, right? And I can't think of a better group of people to help root us moving forward and having pride 365 days um, a year than these people here sitting with me. Um, and so I'd like to introduce them. It's gonna be a short introduction because I really wanna get to the, to the meat of it. And I know you folks are here to kind of hear their Manao. Cool. So first, um, we have our Millie here to my right, who is our moderator for the night. She's a teacher at Ilima Intermediate in Evo Beach and proudly serves on the Gay, Lesbian, Straight Education Network Hawaii Board. She is also a Teach for America Hawaii Alumni Advisory Board member and a member of the Hawaii State Teachers Association Board of Directors. Next, we have Thaddeus in the black shirt, who is the vital, viral hepatitis, which is vital, viral hepatitis prevention coordinator for the Hawaii State Department of Health. He's also the co-founder and co-director of Hep Free Hawaii Coalition. Next to Thaddeus is Dr. Tati Young. She is a mahu healer, scholar, activist, who completed her PhD in anthropology at the University of Washington. She's a university lecturer and a community organizer. Next to Tati is Sarah Kamakoviva Ole, who is a policy and compliance coordinator of the Papa Ola Lokahi, um, which is the Native Hawaiian Health Board. And then lastly, next to me is Mana Shim, who is a Kanaka and 3L at the William S. Richardson School of Law. She's a former player with the National Women's Soccer League and continues to advocate for players in the league. So without further ado, I turn the time over to Millie. Thank you so much, friends. And um, I just I just want to take a minute. Can we just look at everybody here? I don't know about how you feel, but it's been a, it's been a while since we've had pride. Yeah, it's been a while since we've been all together in some space. And my heart is just so full. Um, thank you so much for starting us with music. I think the perfect way to start a movement and talk about that is with um, the gift of music. Uh, one thing I want to talk about, especially in pride spaces to get us started this evening, um, is the importance of inter intersectionality. Um, I myself have ADHD, and one thing that causes for me is I speak very quickly. And I've heard before that can be hard for our online friends who are reading captions. So I'm gonna to try to slow down when I speak, uh, but we always wanna make sure that we're centering everybody in pride space because everyone is welcome. Um, I am in awe of the humans that are up here tonight, and um, I'm so excited to get to talk with them. So I think I'm just gonna go ahead and get it started. I also wanna say it's important to me when we have conversation that if when someone is speaking, if if you have a question for them, let's just have a conversation. So don't, um, if there's something that you want to talk about, I'd love for it to be organic between our panelist members this evening. Um, yeah, so we're just going to go ahead and get into it. So um, starting out tonight, can we just go ahead, can each of you just kind of say what you'd like us to call you and um, something you're working on right now that you're pretty proud of? We can just go in order. That's cool. Hello, everyone. I'm Maleana, but you can call me Mana. <laughs> Mine. Do I need to scoot over? Yeah. I'm, I'm going to stop there. Go ahead. Is it easier if I give her my mic? Can you hear me? Okay. Thank you. 
Oh, talk again. Let's try again. Are we ready? I think it's your fault for calling me Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> I think it'll go. I think you're good. Okay. Okay. Um, aloha. I am Mana and I'm working right now on kind of the Me Too movement-ish. So with the National Women's Soccer League, um, there is a recent expose of a coach that I played for who was sexually harassing me and a couple of my teammates. And there are a couple of other coaches in the league who are Is that one? No, just kidding. Is that on now? Okay, here, I'm just gonna walk a tea. Okay. Ooh. So yeah, Me Too movement stuff. I, um, so I was one of the players that came forward and a story was written about my teammates and, and me and our experience. So we're really trying to push policy. Um, there are current investigations going on. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at, at that for right now, but sexual violence, gender violence, that's one of my main focuses right now. And a lot of it is on the continent. So I'm trying to do stuff from here, but most of the people I'm working with are on the continent. Hello everyone, I'm Thaddeus Pham, he, him. Um, something that we're doing right now is trying to look at data locally so that we make sure our communities are counted. As we saw with COVID, you know, if we don't count the number of people who are affected, we can't provide resources for them. So I think it's really important to show visibility. And part of that is through data. So that's something we're working on right now. Aloha mai kako. Um, something I'm working on right now is looking at the intersectionality of indigeneity, trans and queer identity in order to create political action that is progressive and transformative and inclusive for everyone. So mahalo. Aloha, um, I'm Sarah, something that I'm working on right now, though I do have to disclose, I'm not here on behalf of my employer tonight, um, is just coalition building and policy making that is really informed all the way through. So everything from what's happening on the ground at events, getting translated up into how policy is shaped, who informs best and recommended practices, um, connecting the dots. Oh, I'm Isaac. I'm not really working on anything other than like own personal projects. We're um, sometimes I work with uh, Haku Collective to do a lot of things for uh, musicians. Um, especially the musicians that are kind of like on the fringe of like our own mainstream here in Hawaii. Um, so pulling in funding for native Hawaiian musicians that are not doing uh, just Hawaiian music per se, like traditional Hawaiian music, music outside of different of that genre as well. So sometimes I do that, that kind of stuff, but not really like working on stuff like that. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, one thing I want to add, and I heard some audience participation. Oh, did I make it mad? Okay. Okay, um, I love it when people kind of affirm when others are speaking. So um, one thing we do in my classroom is sometimes we give sparkles. So if you wanna give some sparkle fingers, if you hear something that's positive, or if you wanna give some snaps, it's nice, it can be a little nerve wracking to be up in the space and have all these eyeballs on you. So it's just nice to remember that we're here for pride and we're here for community. So definitely sparkles to all you tonight. Okay, thank you for getting us started. And I think I'm just gonna go ahead and jump into it. and. Um, I'm gonna ask these questions and if there's one of you who wants to answer first, you can kind of go ahead and raise hands. And if nobody answers, I'll pick another question. Um, what, does, what do you think that solidarity means in queer movement spaces? Like how can these people here either help with your work or how can we support each other, especially in this time of COVID when we know the community has been hurting for lack of being able to assemble like this? Who'd like to start us, anybody? Say again? Oh, the mic should work. Oh, huzzah. 
Can we try the mics? Let's try. Does it work? I'll say again to what does solidarity mean in queer movement spaces? Okay, I think everyone's looking at me. <laughs> you got this, rocking. you got this. Give her some um, sparkles. I think something that's key is really trying to figure out how to affirm people and how to build trust and how to acknowledge, um, how would you say it? And not, not that facts aren't important, but not having to fact check things that are part of identity issues. I mean, I think something that really can be debilitating towards movement is when there's a little too much questioning about the person and not the content. Mm. Because we can, you know, we can pick the content to death, hopefully not. Um, but I think often it, when we elapse into kind of like ad hominem and kind of derailing from the discussion to kind of focus on the person, I, I feel like those situations get, they devolve quickly um, and they, you know, they lose their track and not that people are not important, but we have to, in movement, still yet affirm each other and find ways to, you know, to create the safe space. I think it's become such a buzzword, a safe space here, a safe space there, but what does that mean? Um, I think it's really contextually bound, right? And any different permutation of people, the safe space has a different meaning because the people in it are different. Um, and it's really hard. And I think, um, I think one thing that family never shies away from is hard work. Um, and that's something that I've always really admired about so many people in this room today um, is that they're willing to do that hard work. I love that, I love that. And look at all that affirming solidarity just right there. Thank you, Sarah. Sarah with an H, the right way to do Sarah. But, uh, would anybody like to add on to Sarah's answer? Mahalo, Nui, Sarah for that. I, I think hard work is really important. And I think just affirming one another's existence is super important and often taken for granted. So I think just, you know, acknowledging that someone exists is miraculous and important. And honoring that existence can help create solidarity and transcend some of the, um, I think, blockages that come with prejudice and bias. So I think affirmation for me is, is really key and also creating space to honor that diversity and just that existence is really important. I love that. And I think sometimes we need those reminders that um, we get so busy. And I know, again, I see people in this room and I know how hard you do work and that idea of in that space, um, sometimes we forget to be like, hey, you're amazing. Thank you for doing that work. Um, and that and that we really have to make sure, especially in the community, if we are going to build these movements, um, that we're doing that in that space. Um, kind of on that note about solidarity, um, how do you think we build intergenerational movements? How do we involve everybody? Um, can you hear me? Yeah, okay, we got you. Great. <laughs> um, these are really hard questions, but I love them, <laughs> first of all. So Teach your you. life. Okay. Thank you for doing um, the work beforehand. Really appreciate that. I think just building off of what Tati and Sierra were saying, solidarity, solidarity is um, it's work. It's like active, right? It's not a passive thing. We're always doing it. And I think that's something that's why it's so hard, but also why it's so fulfilling, because you know you're always working on it. And so intergenerationally, I just think of, 
how I would talk to my mom versus how I would talk to my brothers, and it's very different, right? Um, and I think it's just acknowledging that we all come to places on different journeys and that we almost have to learn to speak the, like a diversity of languages because each person speaks so differently and comes from a different place. So really acknowledging and working towards listening and engaging with people on their journey. So I think um, I, those are just some of the thoughts that sparked. So thank you. Thank you. I did start with two hard ones and that's the teacher in me. So um, let's go ahead and liven it up a little bit. And um, one thing I know, like we started with music tonight for a really specific reason, right? That the music is can, can be the fuel to the revolution and fuel to community in that space. So, um, and any of you can start with this. So um, what are you reading or watching right now that is giving you happiness? Reading, watching, listening to, binging. Okay. Um, I'm, I just started Anita Hill's book. Raise your hand if you know who Anita Hill is. Yes. Okay, a lot of young people don't know. And I don't know if I'm young or old right now, 30, uh, somewhere in between. Um, but she just wrote a book, and I started it, and I'm on the second chapter and I have to stop because I'm in law school and I have to read textbooks <laughs> and cases. So that's what I'm reading. Um, I'm reading Alice Walker right now. She wrote The Color Purple, but I found this used copy of this book of it. She calls, it's called In Our Mother's Gardens, Womanist Prose, beautiful. So, I mean, I mean, this is like she's writing in 1980 or 1978, and everything she's saying is what's happening now. Like, she's so incisive, but also still warm and beautiful. So it's like reading activist poetry. I highly recommend it. I feel like you've read it too. Yeah, it's gorgeous. So that's what I'm reading right now. For our online friends, they've asked us to speak directly into the mic, just so. Thank you. Aloha. I think for me, I've been following the trans walkout at Netflix because of the Dave Chappelle special. And I think it's really important that, um, that we start to unionize and uh, build coalitions around, you know, really problematic content that isolates uh, and targets specific communities. So I've been following that, but I'm also moved by um, Dave Chappelle's special, actually. And um, thinking about the humanity in the connection um, between him and a trans comedian, but also um, being conscious of the fact that um, trans women, especially black trans women of color, are being um, targeted uh, for murder and disappearance um, at this time in, in our, our country's history. So I think it's really important to, uh, to unionize and to vocalize and to stand up against bigotry and hatred and, and things like that. Um, I am rereading a book called Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer. Uh, and I, I hope not to make light of the, of the great inputs that the others have put in, but I'm also watching a lot of animal videos. I, I think something that is, is really important at this time is, is finding pockets of where do you create joy and, and how do you, you know, how, how are you doing that? Um, I work in health and, um, you know, no, no big deal. Health has been pretty chill these days, right? Um, <laughs> so I think uh, I'm, I'm trying to watch and read things that inspire. And I think braiding sweetgrass is just so full of just incredible 
complex connections and intersections of indigenous wisdom and just this lady who's done some really cool things, frankly, dredged a little lake by herself. Um, and I, I think that especially in, in queer spaces, right, there's so much that can really just suck the life from you. Um, e even if it's not active, right? Sometimes just being in a space that, that feels a little off, you know? You can still function, you're still doing your thing, you're still working, um, but it's, it's not truly comforting. And so you need to invest in your own kind of happiness and joy. And sometimes, that's animal videos, I think. <laughs> I think going off of what you just said, it's really important to like cultivate joy. Um, I feel like especially over the past year and the past few months for me, I, I found myself turning off everything. Like I stopped listening to podcasts. I stopped listening to the news. I just shut everything off because it was just so fucking heavy all the time. And like, I realized how much it was like taking a toll on my mental health. Um, so I started just getting back to listening to music. Like I, I realized that over the past year, I stopped listening to music. Like wasn't listening to anything that I loved. It was just, I just needed to know everything what was happening immediately at that moment. And so um, the one thing recently that's been bringing me a lot of joy is actually an album about grief. Um, I've been listening to Yaba, her new album, Dawn. Listen, the wall that I got through by listening to that album with my microdoses. <laughs> um, <laughs> I cried so freaking much over the past two months, you guys. I haven't cried in like years. <laughs> um, and I'm a Pisces, so I don't know how that works. But, um, but yeah, I've been listening to Yaba and that whole album is, is about her mom and, um, and her coming to terms with her grief. And I think that's one thing that no one really teaches us how to do like when we're growing up is how, to, how do we deal with our grief? And for me, when my grandma passed away, that was like the heaviest thing because that's like my mom. And so I didn't know how to process any of that, you know? So, you know, throughout life, I learned how to do that. And then now I'm listening to this Yaba album and I'm like, yes, 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 all of this, yes. And I'm just like crying on the H3, like, yeah. So Yaba, I'm crying, but I'm also very happy. <laughs> I love the way the direction that both are and you took that, that conversation about creating joy. Um, and um, recently, Dr. Young, you were on a PBS Insight show about the trans community. And one thing that kind of surprised me was that, so the state of Hawaii is 41st in population in the United States, but number one in the amount of trans people who live in our state. And as myself, as a middle school GSA advisor, um, in the 90s, we called it the Gay Straight Alliance, and now it is the Gender Sexuality Alliance. Um, I guess I feel like, okay, if we have that community, why are my kids still getting bullied <laughs> um, in that space? And, um, and I really, I loved watching it. I've been so excited to get to meet you. And one thing that in the special, Dr. Young, that you brought forward was you kept kind of like answering um, with joy, and you had a lot of information to share, and you were happy about sharing it. And I think sometimes because so many of us do carry trauma um, from identity and that idea of like where it's supposed to be heavy, I thought you brought a very happy warrior energy to that conversation. And I'm curious, how do you sustain that? I have to be honest, uh, when I did that uh, interview, I actually had a 104 degree temperature. So that helped a lot actually. <laughs> um, to be honest, I work really well under pressure, unfortunately, on one hand, but on the other hand, it, it, it emotes a different kind of optimism and joy that I'm so happy that everyone was able to, to feel through the lens because I certainly wasn't feeling bad. We couldn't tell. Um, and you really couldn't tell if you watched the show, you really couldn't tell that I had 104 degree temperature. Um, but honestly, that's just kind of how I operate. I'm, I'm a huge optimist in all conditions, even in spaces of abandonment and trauma. And I think it's really important because um, often I'm surrounded by people who are, you know, sad. And so I try to just embody that, you know, le'a le'a, which in Hawaiian is the principle of pleasure. And even in my sickness or even in the darkest times, I try to find that pleasure. 
um, and it emotes from somewhere deep within my na'au, in my in my internal being. Yeah, it's it's that um, it's that space of like grandma making me miso soup. You know, um, it's that space of like my mom, you know, um, holding me while we're watching um, the color purple. You know, um, so it, I think everybody actually has access to that that sense of joy, even in the darkest times. And I think it's sometimes really easy to forget that power that we hold. Um, so I'm so glad that you, you were able to um, feel that joy and optimism uh, through that uh, interview. Uh, and also too, there's something about, um, you know, my roommates here, she knows I was super sick on that day and I was doing the lights and trying to make everything work. Um, you look beautiful. Oh, thank you. Also, you. go watch it. Thank you. She's supposed to twirl her hair if I'm rambling, and I can't. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks, T. Thank you for that. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and kind of like jump topics and kind of talk to speakers. How am I on time, friends? You know. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, so. That is, we met last year for a Rainbow Town Hall um, on education and uh, my friends were speaking on that panel and you were moderating for us. And so I started texting my friend Ryan Mandato and I was like, who's this amazing guy talking about community and pride and education. And so I signed up for the HEP Pre Hawaii emails. And um, one thing I really learned from that space is um, you really focus on educating the community uh, um, about the issues and you communicate a lot, like a lot of constant information coming. Sign up for his emails, they're awesome. Also, he has the cutest float in the tiny float parade. If you guys haven't looked at the tiny floats, check it out. Um, but how do you keep up that energy and how, um, how do you see your work as educating at the same time? Sorry, how do you keep up your energy? Sorry, sorry. and how do you see um, the, your work as education? Can I? Be? Okay, sorry. Um, I take lots of naps for my friends. You know, my favorite hobby is actually lying on the floor and they'll just spread chips around me so I don't even have to get up and I just roll over and I eat a chip and then I go back to sleep. Um, but I do love naps and I think like making time to take care of yourself is so important if you're doing work like movement work. Um, my friends even know like on Saturdays or Sundays, if it's around two o'clock, I'm going to leave to go take a nap. So I'm like, bye guys, we'll see you in a couple hours, right? Um, and I think what actually Tati was saying about power is really important. And I think, the, I mean, I could just send content all the time, but I think the thing that really drives the work that I hope to do is to activate everyone's power that we all already have and that people or systems try to convince us that we don't have. And so I'm just like, never give up your power. Like it's, you have it. Why are you allowing it to be taken from you? Like we, we're just like, in, we're infinities inside of ourselves, right? I've just like, everything that you were saying, I totally kind of vibe with. So beyond content, just know that you are powerful and that you can draw on that. And that's, I think that's what I would hope in anything that we're trying to do is to activate that and remind people of that and take naps. <laughs> and take naps. I love that. I love that. Um, I, you just said talking about taking your power back. Is that the mic? Did I break it? No. It's okay. Okay. Um, and, and if I can speak about taking your power back from, from what you've been experiencing now, um, if you haven't followed the story as she was kind of sharing about what was going on with the national um, NWSL, the women's soccer organization, I am a huge, huge like fangirl all over her soccer fan. Um, I actually, I have a rod in this leg from when I broke it during soccer, so it doesn't work anymore. Um, but Soccer is off, a soccer sports is often a place where queer kids can find community starting out when you have that team spirit. I also think it's a place where um, kids can kind of prove themselves because the, their team counts on them before they know oh, what your pronouns are or your identity. And so athletics can be so important. Um, and I think, well, first of all, I just want to applaud your bravery. Like I just like you were so brave to come forward. And, um, and, and to be here with us tonight and being willing to talk about it, but you took your power back 
Um, and one thing, and, and, and I shared with her, you also gave your story to a queer reporter. Um, and I was curious if that if that was intentional. And if you haven't read Meg, is it Lin, Linheim? How do you say Meg's last name? Yeah, um, it's in The Athletic and it's a really, really incredible piece. And there's a podcast to go with it as well. But um, so you took your power back. How did you do that? And was there intentionality in the reporter? Thank you. This is a very uh, long conversation and I'll try and wrap it up and, and summarize it. But to start with, this was, this was the first time I ever had my power taken away from me in my whole life. Um, soccer was my, my safe place, my sanctuary. It's where I did all of my community building. It was, yeah, when I felt the most confident and powerful when I was playing soccer. And having a coach, a leader, a, a person in power take that away from me, that joy and that safety was heartbreaking and infuriating. I, I can't describe it any other way. But in 2015, I actually reported it to my employer and they basically swept it under the rug, told me to go away um, and let this coach go coach somewhere else. And it wasn't until later that I found out what happened to me happened to many other players. And I, I knew that in my not all, I knew that, but it wasn't until I had that, those other stories to connect with that I was able to um, address it publicly because I was scared. I was scared to come out and talk about it. I didn't want to bring other people down. Um, I didn't want to be vulnerable in that space because I had a feeling it would be a big story. This coach, um, he won coach of the year at least twice. So what I did when I found out that this happened to other players, I called my most powerful friend in the world that I know. Her name is Alex Morgan. And she said, let's go to work. We got to do something about this. And we put together a team of resources. We have three incredible attorneys, a um, strategic communication firm. And seven of us went to work every week, pretty much. We met for an hour about. Um, all of it was pro bono, and we did it um, strategically. We had to go step by step. So the first thing we were concerned about was policy making. We didn't have a, a harassment policy. I was never given as an employee a, a anti-harassment um, policy. There was nothing in there. So when I had to tell my story, or when I reported what happened to me, there was no HR that I knew of. You know, I had to go look for all of this. So our first thing was we need to put this in place to protect players right now. So we did that first. And then we went back around and we sent emails and we said, hey, this coach, he's a predator and we need to get him out. Um, uh, so it was just a long process. And finally, it came to telling our story with a reporter. And it was interesting you ask about that because we did choose a queer um, writer who covered women's soccer for a very long time. And it was a we went back and forth, like, do we want to go New York Times, Washington Post? And we decided to go smaller with The Athletic. And yeah, she did an incredible job. And it turned out to be bigger than any of us ever imagined. My life has changed in the last three weeks. I don't know how long it's been, but yeah, something like that. And then one other thing about it, some, uh, so Tarina is here, and I think she's the only one from, oh no, Alejandro is here. We are in Professor Mari Matsuda's Organizing for Social Change class in the law school. If you do not know Professor Mari Matsuda, you must get to know her because she is brilliant and incredible and very inspiring. But this was my organizing project. So my classmates helped me go to work every day on this and push through when it was really difficult. How amazing is that? Like I just, oh. 
and the idea of, and, and definitely look up the story, but that you got games canceled, you got people fired, you're getting accountability for that piece. And that's part of the movement work too. Like the idea of accountability has to be there. And I think, especially for women's soccer, the idea was you've got to stay quiet because else they won't make money or the league is not going to do well. And, and I think sometimes in queer organizations that can be there too, of just like, keep it down. Don't, don't ruffle feathers. Don't upset people because the idea of is we have to stay there and it's just incredible work. Um, you got the teams, I think it was that all the teams stopped their game at, at like eight minutes or like, um, yeah, just, just look it up. It's amazing. And I'm thinking, yeah. Yeah, it was six minutes because it's been six years since I first reported the harassment to the team. And it was so moving. I went to one of the games and walked out on the field and just sobbed. And it really is a beautiful thing. And I, I encourage all of you to check it out just to see um, how powerful it can be when, when people come together and work for, for a common cause. And I know that sounds really like, duh, everybody knows that already, <laughs> but it's beautiful. It's a beautiful thing. And yeah, I'm so stoked. Like I'm so happy that we have all this support and also that these people are losing their jobs. Like we can't have these people coaching our team. I'm just so over that. So if any of you want to be soccer coaches, <laughs> there, <laughs> there are some open positions. You took your power back. And in that, you, you are making history. You are making change. And, and someone's going to look back on that as, as a moment of change. And I'm going to actually throw it over to Sarah, uh, talking about why it's so important that when in policymaking, we understand historical context. And I know you've done some is it like research or scholastic study about that. Why do we need to know our history to make sure we're making good movement decisions? Um, well, thanks, Mona, for sharing. What a powerful, you know, experience that story about walking on the field kind of gave me a little chill. Um, and I will get to the question, I promise. But I think, I think you make an incredible point about traumatic experiences and power being able to be concurrent, right? I, th I think so many times we think about, I have to get over my trauma, right? I have to kind of become whole again before I can take power and then go do something, that that is some kind of like linear path that once I get through my trauma about X, Y, Z, then I can move forward in power and, and do things and change things. Um, but I think your story about right having to, to work through and claim your power at the same time is really moving. So mahalo for sharing. Um, history, those who do not know it are doomed to repeat it, right? Um, I think Hawaii has you know, such, a, such an incredible, incredible history, not only from the Bakahiko or the kingdom, but also from the plantation era, from so many different cultures assimilating. There is so much to talk about and unpack there. Um, and I think it, it really helps us to point to policy that's centered around values. Um, because I think when you're trying to build with others, it is a quite an interesting time if you haven't had that first groundbreaking discussion about do we even all agree about where we're trying to go and, and what we will and won't do on the way there. Um, road trip, but don't pack the car. Kind of. <laughs> um, so I think history really has so many lessons and and so many lessons that aren't necessarily in the words that are there, right? How, how many books do we have that are written by women throughout the history of the world? Um, and beyond women, right? How, how, many, <laughs> how many books do we have from people we know do not fit in a gender binary, people who we think practice, you know, like something that we didn't even know they practice? Um, I think there's so much in history kind of between the lines um, that sometimes is through oral tradition or other kinds of storytelling um, where there's extra, extra sauce, extra richness um, that we can reclaim.
because our history is ours to reclaim. I want to say that again, that our history is ours to reclaim. There's so many patterns in the conversation tonight, the taking your power back. History is ours to reclaim the idea of creating joy. Um, Isaac, I'm going to go ahead and talk about music. And um, thank you so much for Strawberry Moon because um, I'm obsessed with that song and I've been playing it. Shout out to my partner. So that's what I think of when I think of that Strawberry Moon song. And I love that you tell the origin stories of the music. Um, I'm curious too, because we know music sustains us as you were talking about driving and, um, and, and how you were finding your emotion in that place. How does, how do you think music fuels the movements and organizing people? I mean, it's obviously the thing that brings everybody together because everybody loves music. If you don't love music, weird. <laughs> no judgment, but okay. Um, but I think that's the thing that brings everybody together, right? It brings everyone into the space. It makes everyone feel safe. It makes everyone, it kind of, like you said, like it activates the space so that the work can be done in larger settings like this. When I was on Mauna Kea, it was, it was, there was music all the time, the whole time when I was up there in the kitchen, you could just hear it from the kitchen, like music all the time. And it didn't, it wasn't all just these songs about Ku'e, and it wasn't just all these traditional Hawaiian songs. It was like, you know, Natalie Aikomau up there, she was singing an Adele song, and Damien Marley, Damien, no, Damien or Ziggy? Ziggy came up. I don't know, I was in the kitchen the whole time, but um, not eating, like working. <laughs> wow. I felt some of you judging me for a second. <laughs> um, but I think that's the thing, right? It's the thing that makes everything, everyone feel comfortable. Everyone let their guard down because I think that when you have all these apprehensions coming into like a really, really big setting with everybody, sometimes the work is really hard to do. Um, so I think that's one way. Um, I just like immediately think of Nina Simone when I think about like um, the work, like using music to uh, propel a movement forward. And I think about, I also think about how sad that story is too, how, how she really like, she felt that passion to use her voice and use her music and to, to relay these messages, right? But, you know, she at the same time was at this, uh, at the same time coming up with like Aretha Franklin, right? And Aretha Franklin was getting all this, this fame and all this stuff, but she kind of sacrificed all of that, you know, her mental health, she sacrificed so much for the movement that she believed in. And um, so I think that's another thing that we can't like really forget about either is the toll that it takes on some of these artists as well. Um, and I think one thing I'd love to see more in like music when it comes to like movements is more joy. I feel like there's like, and I love like the anger and the, you know, the passion and all that stuff, but I really would love to see more poetry um, and stuff that will transcend time. You know, like a lot of the old like Hawaiian songs that we have for, for us, you know, like those things transcend time. And yes, they were, some of those things were written in anger, but they were, they were, uh, they embodied beauty. And so it was able to kind of come to us in this time. And we use those songs all the time, you know? I just wish we had more of that. I don't know that wasn't, if that was an answer to the question. That was, but. and I'm gonna give you a follow-up too. Um, just speaking to, you talked about getting to a place where you were like, okay, no more podcasts, no more news. As someone who, who tends to overconsume news in real time and just being really nervous about making sure I'm updated and know all the things and as intellectually sharp as I can be. And it does build that anxiety. I think during COVID, a lot of us were experiencing anxiety. And I'm just curious what, what made you kind of come to that place where you just like you had enough or you just decided the music was more important or what made you be able to kind of shift to that focus of music and turning some of that noise off? I just realized that I hated everyone. Like seriously, I was so angry at everything and everyone and like it started to like overflow into like my, fa like my family relationships. I started to get really, really angry and I was super short with my mom. Like we were talking about intergenerational stuff. Like I got really short with my mom. Like I just wanted to shake her and be like, why don't you understand this stuff, you know? And, but it was because I was just consuming it nonstop. And so I think I just shut it off completely. And then I realized that there had to be a healthy balance because when I did shut it off completely, I also realized that I wasn't, like I kind of also lost a little bit of the passion to get involved. So I think it's good to be aware of what's happening because there's so much happening. Um, but I, I, I think there's a healthy balance between the two. And 
also remembering to keep our joy. Thank you for that. Um, I, I teach middle school, like I said, and I have um, all my GSA kids. They're uh, affectionately my gabies, you know, the little kiddos. Um, I'm curious to the, to the panel, what would you tell middle school self? What would you, at this pace in time, what would you say to middle school you? And you could take a minute. I know that's deep. I'm ready. Go. Okay. This is my younger self, my current self, my future self, is to tell the truth. And the more I've told my truth, even when it's been very difficult, the easier, easier it's, it's become. Is that grammatically correct? I don't know. I'm not grading, it's okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I came up to my mom. Everyone has a different age, but I think I was 10. My sister says seven. My mom, I think, says eight. Um, yeah, and I remember it was less than a mile up the road from here. And I remember carrying that around with me, thinking, oh my gosh, I'm gay. I don't know what to do about this. I don't have anyone to tell. And I was anxious at night. I would sit in bed and think about it. And I finally came out and, and told her. She was the first person I told. And it was terrifying. But when I said it aloud for the first time, I, it was just a, a sigh of relief. And I've done that over and over and over in my life when things start to build up and I'm, I feel alone and scared. I tell my truth, whatever it is in that moment, and it sets me free. I know that's a cliche thing to say, but I also think in this space, we have a tendency to really want to hold each other because we have all struggled with things, right? And, and experienced trauma. And we feel a need to protect each other and to protect ourselves. But I, I kind of try to shift things a little bit in the other direction. Maybe it's the athlete in me, but to really push people because I think when you do go outside of your comfort zone, of course, within safe boundaries, I think that's where you really grow and learn. And I want everyone in here to know that when you do that, when you take that step, you have a whole community behind you to hold you and support you. Um, that's so beautiful. <laughs> I really, and all the speakers just engender so many thoughts throughout this night. And what you've just brought up in me is this idea that, well, first, I guess I'll answer the question. No, I'll start with you, because that was so beautiful. But really the idea that we, it's okay to be uncomfortable, and that growth comes from that discomfort, again, within safe boundaries. So I think allowing ourselves to be imperfect and to make mistakes and to know that people are still there for us is, is really powerful. So thank you for bringing that up. I think it's so beautiful. Um, what I would tell my middle school self um, is just to keep going, I think. Because it's sometimes I'm looking around and I'm, we're in this amazing space with people who are so supportive and I get to be here and I have to go through all the stuff that I've been through to get to where I am now. So I'm, I think I'm just really grateful to have gone through the hard times, but also have gone through all the beautiful times that I've experienced in my life. So just keep going, little Thaddeus, I think. Do you remember the It Gets Better campaign? <laughs> well, I was coming of age when that was, you know, the thing. And then Alok came along and said, it gets bitter. And um, I think it's both. And, and uh, so I think it's really important to hold those tensions uh, and those, uh, you know, conflicts um, because it gets better and bitter. Uh, let's keep it real. Um, but I think the bitterness tastes delicious. Uh, when you can drink from the vai vai and the wealth of your stories. 
and um, your stories is that that power in your na'au when you can drink your own waters and, and the bitterness of those waters um, and be transformed by them. Um, life, life is so fabulous. So I just want to tell my seventh grade self, like Mary. <laughs> Mary, I'm talking to you over here. Listen, Mary, I stay over here. Not over there, Mary, look. Um, so my seventh grade self was very busy all over the place, shiny things, yeah. So, um, Mary, you have a PhD now. What you gonna do? No, and I, I say that because I, I grew up in an environment where mahuahine or trans women who are Native Hawaiian that I grew up with were either sex workers, hairdressers, um, or you know, uh, completely um, destitute. So for me, it was that bitterness, um, the abuse that I saw my aunties experience as trans women, um, hearing their stories, their bitterness allowed me to live a better life. Um, and my experiences of bitterness, of sexual violence, of being raped, of being um, abandoned, you know, that trauma, um, you know, drinking from that water, you know, allowed me to uh, survive enough to see the beauty of all the people and all the aloha that came from those who loved me. And I think it's so important to never forget the bitterness and the betterness um, and to drink from all of those waters because in the brokenness, you are whole, you know, as you mentioned earlier, you know, you don't have to wait till you're whole again or like this idea that, oh, something will make me whole outside of myself. It's like your brokenness is whole and complete. And sometimes we, uh, forget that. So I just um, want to say mahalo for all the all the different mana and um, you know <laughs> strength and courage uh, that is required to create a safe space. It takes courage to create a safe space. So I don't always say like, oh, this is a safe space. I I try to say this is a safe and courageous space. Um, we can't always depend on safety to save us, right? So, yeah, mahalo. Can we just soak that in? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> wow, mahalo for that. That was incredible. Um, also, my seventh grade self needed your seventh grade self because my seventh grade self was busy crying in the bathroom. <laughs> A lot, <laughs> fellow Pisces. <laughs> um, I, wow, what would I tell my seventh grade self? Um, I think so, so many things, right? I think, I feel, I feel like everyone here is thinking, I feel like there's so much churning energy right now because what a stressful question that we're all now <laughs> pouring over together. I think it would be, you can only control what you can control. And in seventh grade, I was the kind of like super anxious, always crying kind of, of little potato thing that tried to manipulate things that I truly had absolutely no control over, right? like child abuse and neglect, nothing was gonna change. Um, those, you know, what, what happened to us was going to happen to us. A lot of it was not about anything we did or didn't do. So I think if I could talk to my seventh grade self and try to impart that upon someone who was truly <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm laughing because my seventh grade self truly was a hot mess. Um, but, you know, it, it would be to let go of those things that I wanted to 
influenced so badly that I, you know, I was what, how old are you in seventh grade? 12, 13? Yeah. Like, right? Like, what, <laughs> whatever was happening outside of my little, you know, almost teenage brain, right? Like, those were things that, I, you know, I wasn't going to change. I wasn't going to change the fashion of wearing four camisoles on top of each other at the school dance. <laughs> Um, and so, you know, like, what, how, what would it have been like if I had understood that as a child and just, right, taken all the opportunities and, and rode the wave and, and ac accepted being weird? <laughs> um, and maybe also if I had stopped trying to control so many things that my child self could not control, I wouldn't have been so anxious and crying in the bathroom all the time. <laughs> um, but I just think so many powerful pieces coming through that um, I think really just shine a light on a lot of what we've been talking about and also kind of I think it's like the byline of this session tonight, right? Is how, how do you start a movement? And I'm grateful for the opportunities and experiences that I've been able to work in policy and learn a lot of things about systems thinking and collective impact and all these kind of technical shenanigans. Um, but the mo movement starts in you, right? In you, when you can move through and hopefully feel you know, safe to move through those things that hurt and those things that you can't control and all of the kind of crushing parts, your own movement within yourself, I think is so often dampened for our community and that you are frozen in those moments where you feel really small. And so I hope that everyone in this room can feel less small and can start feeling that inside movement, Dr. Young, like the, the na'au, you know, like I think those are truly where movements start is deep within yourself when you can unfreeze those pieces in time from seventh grade and, you know, and really link arms with the next person and in that, that of itself, right? That's the movement. We totally would have been friends crying together. <laughs> um, I just wanna say that I honor everything that you all said. That was so beautiful and I like caught like a quick vision of all of us as little kids sitting on these pillows like talking about, when you said hugging little Thaddeus, I was like, I'm gonna fucking cry. <laughs> I'm gonna cry right now. Um, I, as an artist, I, um, I always visit my younger self. I always, always, always visit little Isaac. <laughs> I think about him all the time. Um, it's a practice that I use in order to try and get to like the truth of what I'm trying to say when I'm writing and what it is I really want to communicate to the world. Um, so I'm always, always taking this trip inside of me and I visit that little kid because a lot of my inspiration and my music in the beginning came from trying to comfort myself because I didn't feel like anyone else around me could do that for me, especially because of the religion that I was in. Um, I was afraid that I couldn't talk to my family about it, the time that I was in, so I was afraid that I couldn't talk, my, talk to my friends about it. Um, so I just always felt alone. And so that's where my music really came from. Um, and I think about it a lot, like what would I say to my younger self and specifically my seventh grade self, I would probably tell him to express more. Don't be afraid to express. Don't be afraid to sing in front of people and, and don't be afraid, like listen to your grandma when she tells you, get up and sing, you know, and don't fight it and listen to that and just my hila hila and give them. Um, and I would just say to him that your family loves you. I think I was really insecure about that as a kid. But when I came out to my mom, she, she didn't care. She was so happy for me, you know? And um, my sisters were the same. My grandma was like a super, super strict Mormon. No problems. My grandpa loves me. 
loves seeing me on TV and dresses and pearls. He doesn't, he doesn't care. He just sees that I'm happy. And so I think that's, those are the two things to, I would tell myself is just express more and that your family loves you. Can we just give some love for those amazing answers? Thank you. I think, I do believe that radical truth transforms us. And, um, and in sharing tonight, you were giving to others here too. Um, I'm a note taker, so I'm just gonna kind of share some statements and I'd like us to sit with them um, as what was kind of shared. Um, one being the movement starts in you. Drink the bitterness and the betterness. Take your power back. Create joy and keep going. So thank you for helping us with that tonight. I believe, are we gonna start the questions and answers? Oh, okay, we're okay. We're okay to keep going on that one. Um, so thinking about that, and also by the way, again, as the GSA sponsor, so again, that's Gender Sexuality Alliance Club. You're all invited to come talk to my seventh graders because you will meet your seventh grade self in my classroom and in those spaces. Um, you brought up an interesting point, Isaac, about the um, that coming out experience. And I think because I frame a lot of things in coming out in like trauma space, I'm always really protective of these students. I always expect when they come in to tell me their coming out story um, that it's gonna be heavy or I, I worry about them. And, um, and that really schooled me because, and this also kind of came to my head when I was watching the Insight special, Dr. Young, of um, the kids, you know, the kids get support from each other and, and, and families are starting to be perhaps more accepting than our seventh grade selves families perhaps were. And um, that we have to be careful not to anchor our trauma in the next generation, that we have to make sure that, um, and we cannot expect that they don't have the support they need. Cause right, they might come into loving arms and get hugs and everything is fine. Um, and I think for myself, um, I, there's a, a story I'll tell There's a student and they may be watching, uh, but they wanted to, um, if you've noticed in, in youth culture, especially as see how old I am, the, the coming out video has become a big deal. So it's a big deal to like set up a hidden camera and, um, and come out and then share that reaction. And that just like, it makes me like, sit, you know, freak out because I don't, I worry for those babies, right? Like I worry for what that is, especially when that's, that's kind of put on camera. And so this student wanted to come out in front of the entire extended family by putting an ornament on the Christmas tree that he was going to turn and it was going to be there. And I was just like, oh, and again, a coming out story is your own. That's not, that's not me. That's not my, but I just remember, you know, the, like when you're on break as a teacher, like you carry those babies with you, like they're always with you and just seeing, and I was just like, oh no. <laughs> and the kid came back from break and everything was fine. And, and I just like that just, just gave me in that moment and in that space. So I think about as we're talking about younger selves, right? And, um, and for what we would speak to them too, how do, because <laughs> now, now we're the adults in the room and that's always scary to be like, now I'm like, you know, on field trips and stuff, I look for the adultier adults. <laughs> like <laughs> the fact that I'm in charge of anybody is trippy. Um, but in that way, uh, what do you think we should do to make sure the gabies, the, the younger uh, generations in, in our movements, how, how do we raise them right? Because, you know, honestly, someone, you know, our chosen family raised us. So how do we give to them in a way that continues to build these movements? What do we tell the babies? I just think being like as gentle as possible, but also not setting up this uh, this relationship of like authority and then you're the one that has to follow what I say just because I'm older because there's so many people who are older than me that I'm like, you have absolutely no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> but like, you're a mess. <laughs> so like, I don't know, I think that's, I think it's it's this weird thing that you kind of, I've, I've never had to navigate because I don't work with kids and I don't, my sisters don't, no one has kids in our family yet and, yeah, so I don't have that like experience. Um, I don't know, maybe you folks will have more <laughs> insight to that. Hi. So um, I grew up in a big Ohana as, you know, um, where I was like raising babies when I was a baby. 
Um, so by the time I grew up, I was so tired of um, kids already. Um, and it's okay to not have kids. I think um, everyone should know that because <laughs> the pressure to have kids is in itself its own kind of like madness that, um, that we need to kind of move beyond as well. Um, and I love Keiki. So I also want to say that. Uh, so, you know, uh, my nieces and nephews, I call them my nibblings. Um, I think it's also important to create language for your own special relationship to Kiki uh, so that it gives them the space to kind of be like, okay, I don't have to fit into the confines of heteronormativity because I get anti-tati. Um, and what else? So I really love what Isaac said, that breaking down the authoritarian, you know, thing. And I was thinking about like, you know, what about a show where like some of us from Generation X have conversations with millennials and just be like, learn with and from uh, the younger generation, you know? Because I think sometimes the whole idea is like, well, I have all this wealth of experience, you know, and you don't have much. And then it kind of creates this um, binary that we should break out of. So I think that the exchange, that third space of like receiving and giving, yeah, um, needs to, to come through. And for the Gabies, let me look in the camera. <laughs> Mary, give it to them. Just give it to them and never stop giving it to them. <laughs> I love it. Um, just for our audience, too, can you define nibblings really quick? Because I love that word. That's a new one. Can you know what nibblings means? Can you tell them? Oh, gosh. Well, it's like just it's adorable. And then also it's like nibbling. Because um, I also feel like I, I like to have fun, too. So I don't want to be like an attitude that's nibbling. Oh. Sorry. I call them by. So, um, yeah, nibblings, it actually came from my ex, who I'm no longer with. Um, <laughs> but anyways, we came up with the term together because we like the idea of siblings and being, you know, um, and the nieces and nephews, the N. Um, so nibblings. Um, and also, I think it's a snack because um, they're so cute. Okay. <laughs> I love that. And um, again, I have to plug that PBS special because I learned so much vocabulary from Dr. Young in that space. And I think language is powerful. Yes, on that, that space. Anybody else curious of that question? I don't wanna follow that up, but I do have something important that I wanna talk about. And I would say boundaries. I don't think kids, I don't think it's super, um, intuitive or easy to learn on your own. And I think adults, it's one thing that we really model for kids is how to have healthy boundaries and how we are all a collective, but we also have separate feelings and we have identities and um, just really understanding where we can put those things and how we can carry ourselves in relationships and conversations and have healthy boundaries. And I think it's something that we all need to work on together and talk about more. Cause it's, yeah, it's not, it's not easy. I definitely agree with that, the boundary space. And it's tough, especially because, and I'm sure we, we felt that like, um, I always felt like I had to explain like, okay, so yes, I am in my home and you've seen me on Zoom for 10 hours today, but I can't take your phone call, <laughs> right? In, in that idea, because we all were kind of in the same place, but still being like, I, I'm just gonna take this time to watch some bad TV or, and, and that being okay in that boundary space, um, especially. So thinking about um, where we're moving forward and just, um, I'd like to, if you have any projects you're working on or things you'd like to plug, would somebody like to share anything going on that they want to tell more about? Sure. Another thing we're working on at the law school is we're putting together a mental health uh, program. We have a committee that Alex in the back is on and another student and we have a couple of advisors and it's something that I think every uh, professional school for sure, but also just all working spaces should have, um, we, we just need better mental health resources. 
I'm diagnosed bipolar and yeah, thanks for the snaps. We're pretty awesome, the hey, bipolar are. people in the room. Um, yeah, so that, that is an, an intersection that I think we have a lot of work to, to do in that area. And I know for me, it was kind of, it was the queer identity and addressing trauma and, and sexual abuse. And, and then I think the last thing was really my, my mental health. And that felt like a very individual, isolated journey. And it wasn't, I didn't have role models in athletics or uh, really I just had my sister who is also diagnosed bipolar. And I wish I had other people in the community that I could talk to, especially indigenous people, queer people. And I wanna encourage all of us to have, have the conversation about mental health. So I welcome you all into that space. Please engage with me and others on the topic. Um, I'll just invite all of you to join our sexual and gender minority work group. I think some people are here from it. Um, and all we are is a space, even though it's in the Department of Health with a major bureaucracy, to listen and to hopefully make change. So everything we do is driven by what people tell us they need. And every single voice matters. So even though we can't do it all right away, or we can't make it happen right now, we, we want to know so that we can figure out how to get there. So if you want to join that, or you know someone who wants to join that, just reach out to me and I will fully um, welcome them in and figure out how we can move forward. Mahalo uh, Nui. I'm actually teaching a class called the Intro to um, um, LGBTQ studies at the University of Hawaii. So if anybody has any resources or things that they wanna share that they feel like LGBTQ studies needs to include, please let me know. Uh, this class is also gonna be um, HAP focused, so Hawaii, Asian Pacific Islander focused as well. So looking at indigeneity, um, you know, cultural history, and the stories uh, embedded within indigenous cultures in Hawaii and the Pacific as a means to uh, transform, uh, you know, current political systems, uh, just with those stories, the power of stories is really, really remarkable. And I, I just wanna say mahalo nui for everyone sharing um, stories here. And I'm just so inspired, so mahalo. I think well, one coalition that I hope is not too stressful, even though it's been a while, um, that I am a part of is the um, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander Hawaii COVID Response Recovery and Resilience Coalition. And that's something that my work org provides the backbone structure for. And a big part of the the conversation that kind of ebbs and flows as, as the pandemic has continued is, is what happens next. And I think there are so many coalitions doing parallel work um, about the big shifts that people want to see in Hawaii's economy, in Hawaii's industries, um, in local policies and politics, in so many different things. And I just encourage everyone in the room um, to just share feedback. I think even if it feels kind of silly, a lot of people are, are really interested to hear what community members from all different areas and all different walks of life, like what, what is going on? And those are the messages you know, that, that people really need in order to shape policy that reflects what people want and need um, is that communication. And I think that can be really hard. It can be really hard for certain communities whose information and data kind of get rampantly abused, frankly, to continue to feel that it's not, you know, taking away from them to continue sharing feedback. But I would encourage people to 
um, find something that feels resonant, right? If you don't like talking to one coalition that, you know, gives someone else a chance, get a chance. Um, get a chance. Uh, so just some encouragement that um, so much work is going on and um, I feel like your voice matters and your thoughts matter and your priorities need to be shared in order to be reflected. Um, and it's a big ask. And I hope that people feel that it's an ask that they can respond to. Um, I'm currently working on an art installation with Shangri-La um, called 8x8. Eight eight. So yeah, it, um, it pairs um, eight visual artists with eight uh, performance artists um, in one of the galleries out at Shangri-La. So the prompt for this installation is connection and I'm choosing to do minds on um, self-connection. So connecting with the self. Um, yeah, I'm really excited about that. So we start filming in November and should be out hopefully in January or February. So check that out. Yeah. Oh, I can ask one more. Okay. All right. So then I'm going to go to my final one then. Okay. Final round. Um, I, okay. So Sarah, you were talking about like what's next. And I think I bristle when I hear people think like, we need to get back to normal. And I was like, oh, I don't know if normal was like great for all everybody, especially the friends in this room. Um, and we know we movement build to build a better world. So I'm curious from the panel here, what does the world as it should be look like to you? Oh my gosh, I'm, I'm panicking right now because we've gone this whole night without talking about climate change. <laughs> and it's terrifying. But to honestly, talking about solidarity and, and purpose and identity, that is someplace we can all meet. We have to think about it all the time. It is urgent. Also, it's not as stressful if we talk about it and tell our truth about it and hug each other and love each other while we, we move forward. But yes, that, for me, that's like what, what we have coming up and what we're sitting in right now. And we really need to collectively do things. <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> and, um, and it's related to everything else we're talking about, right? So it's like when we're talking about anti-racism and climate change and queer spaces, all of that is the work. And I think um, just acknowledging, maybe to answer the question was about the world, maybe just acknowledging that <laughs> Um, everything's connected, right? And, and sometimes it's really hard to remember that. There's this quote, I think, I forget who it's by, but he says, when you pull up a plant, it's connected to the rest of the world. And I think that's so beautiful. Like, we can't just look at one single issue. Every issue is our issue as just people, as queer people, as any, every single kind of person we are, so. Absolutely. Um, and I think of Mauna Kea, obviously, and the need to protect Earth from desecration as a direct form of intervening in uh, climate change. And so when Kanaka and allies and accomplices and uh, people ascend to protect the sacred, the sacredness of our planet, I think it's a call to action for all of us. It's not just about those Hawaiians or, you know, people trying to stop the um, the, the the Enbridge line or you know uh, Standing Rock trying to stop the um, extractive technologies um, of fuel development. You know, it's connected to all of us, and you know, I think all of us are also in some ways guilty of, you know, being reliant on fossil fuels. So we really have to think transformatively, and I use the word trans um, um, poignantly because we have to transform the systems under which we live. And so when we think about trans people, you know, uh, it makes me think of transformation 
And I think that's something we must all engage in, in, in being progressive and moving forward beyond these extractive and, and desecratory and destructive and predatory technologies. And I truly believe that with all of the power that we have in each one of us and all around the world, we can do it. Let's do it together. How am I supposed to say anything after this? <laughs> um, I think maybe the question was like, what does it look like? Um, what does the world, um, what does the world as it should be look like to you? I think I might just be really literal and say, I wake up in the morning, um, not in a rush, life's good. I'm not afraid that, you know, we're going to destroy the ozone or that my phone is made out of metals that were mined by children who shouldn't be working or that I am supporting a system that is, you know, like, destroying the lives of everyone I love. Um, all of that is gone. And I just am kind of waking up and it's a good morning and the sun is shining and the trades are back up to what they used to be, which is almost every single day in the year. Climate change um, has changed that. Um, and it feels aligned. And everybody else that I know has the same morning. I think the world that I would love to see moving forward is um, having more Wahine and Mahu leaders um, in our communities directly here in Hawaii, um, more indigenous leaders here in Hawaii, um, deoccupation, period. Um, <laughs> no, seriously, <laughs> I would love that. <laughs> um, and, um, I don't know. That's a lot to ask for, so I'll just stop there. <laughs> Is it a lot to ask for, though? I don't think so. Yeah. I believe in dreaming big, so yes. Okay, so I think we are going to ask the questions that are online. Is that the goal next? Okay. So we have friends joining us online. Thank you so much. You want to go? Okay. Um, so, oh, hi, Nikos online. How can education around human sexuality in Hawaii's public schools be improved to better affirm the dignity and worth of sexual and gender minorities? I'll read that one again. Okay. So, how can education around human sexuality in Hawaii's public schools be improved to better affirm the dignity and worth of sexual and gender minorities? Thank you, Nikos. I want to hear from Dr. Young, but I would just like to say that in order for something to be improved, it has to exist. Can we start with that? If it must be improved, then it has to exist. And if I'm not mistaken, I think that we are in a space where that kind of education is not common. What is it called? Common core? Common core. Part of the common core. You get to drop that mic because you're right. Just throw it down. Yes. All right. So um, we can also ask the audience questions. So if there are questions in the audience, I can run to you with the mic. If someone would like to ask a question. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Or she can run to you with the mic. Hello, hello. Um, so my question is on criticism. So whenever you're in kind of like a movement space, I think it's kind of a given that you might get some sort of feedback or criticism, usually from the opposing side. But how do you deal with criticism when it comes from your own community or your own like peers? That, <laughs> that's such a good question. Um, I work for the Department of Health, so I get criticism all the time. <laughs> I think it's what I get paid to do. But um, I think truly you have to listen to it. And I, I can give you a, an example. So when we were first putting out our this data report, it was like Hawaii's first data report that showed the health of sexual and gender minority people. We were so proud, right? Because we're like, it's a first one. It's going to make change. And it did. But when we brought it to the community, the community was like, that was great, but 
and they list everything that's wrong with it, right? And if we just were just stuck in our own privilege and we're just like, uh, we didn't listen, then who would care about this report? So what we did is we listened, we took all the feedback, um, and, and the feedback was good. It was, the feedback was stuff like, this is great that he is, but this is a very colonial way of collecting data where you check a box. So what about stories, right? Or this is great, but where's the data for um, trans youth, right? And these are all really important things. And if we just closed our ears to it, we would not have been able to move forward. So I think it was mentioned earlier, but sitting in the, that discomfort is so important and it's the hardest thing to do. I'm uncomfortable all the time, so. Um, but I think it's really important just to listen and just to be uncomfortable and to know that that's okay. I also will say that it's a lot easier to take criticism if you're also being built up by your peers and your circles. And if the, your people are not building you up, then you may need new people. Another good message for seventh grade self too. I think, oh, hello. I think a note, just a note is, what is the difference between criticism and an attack, right? Because if something is a, a criticism that is truly coming from an intention of wanting to improve your work, someone who can express it in a way that's not, you know, volatile. Um, I think criticism is a very certain word to me, and I like receiving it because I think that criticism, the way that I've defined it in my mind, is something that is given to me with the intention of genuine improvement. And if, if comments that are supposed to be criticism do not kind of meet those criteria in my head, which are also contextual, you know, that then I actually think the step back is, is this criticism or is this an attack? All right, we've got another question from online. Um, where or in whom did you find inspiration when you most needed it? Let me say it again. Where or in whom did you find inspiration when you most needed it? My kufuna, definitely kufuna. And it's the hardest criticism to listen to and also the one that fills you up the most. And you can always rely on and you always have those generational ties and they are, they're with you all the time. And sometimes I think people around me can provide me with what I need, but that's not true. And that tie and that connection to my kupuna is really what, what gets me through the hardest times. I also just wanna add on to that like Aina as well, like being in, for me over the past year, like surfing every day and being in the ocean, sometimes by myself, it's like, that's, it just refills your cup so quickly. And then also being in service to I know with your community. So whether it's like a cleanup or you're working in the lo'i or wherever you're going, making sure that you're giving time back to the community and giving time back to Aina as well is, is a lot of, for me as an artist, that feeds me so much. And as a person, it gives me a lot of energy to move forward and to go through my day. Cause then I have all these images of beauty in my mind that I kind of like, when times get hard throughout the day, I kind of run to those spaces in my head. And then I'm kind of just on autopilot for a little while. And I'm like thinking about, oh yeah, I was surfing. Oh, that was such a nice day. I was surfing, like surfing, surfing, surfing. <laughs> but yeah, I know. Those are also the same thing for those of you who do not know. Kupuna and Aina and Kai, they're all together. They're one. And that's the beauty of indigenous peoples and especially Hawaii. Also, I really want to say if we can all turn to the kitchen and mahalo this space because that's where that's the home of Vai Vai. And this space is 
so beautiful. And really for me, it is a leader in, in OEV voices, in community building, in addressing climate change. And I just want all of us to appreciate that. And mahalo you for always showing up and taking care of us. Anybody else want to do the inspiration question or audience questions anymore? Should bring you the mic. Okay. Hi, sorry, my pen ran out of ink, so I haven't um, been able to write this down and organize the thought, but it's been marinating since um, Isaac's song um, on Mon from Mauna Kea and from Pele, um, and also linked to the thought about uh, the current events being overwhelming and too much. I think with organizing, with movements, especially queer movements, even it's not just the now that's too much. If you look historically, it can also be too much. So much of our history is trauma. So much of our collective knowing is AIDS and abuse or invisibility or, you know, uh, in the bar scene being ridiculed. And so we've come so far. And I think that's a great part of our movement. Um, and when you whether I want to take your class. And I think when you look at the history and you look at um, where we came from, I think as a young person, students listening, or even as someone who's you know, trying to do something and be involved, um, it can be like way too overwhelming to think of where do you put yourself when you're trying to do the right thing, right? Where do you actually enter the work? And how do you know that that work is the right thing to be doing given all of the trauma that we've uh, come from? And so I guess the question is, uh, if with those circles of comfort and growth, in, if you think about that outside of the growth zone where it's too much, how do you know when you're there and when you have to dial back into a growth zone that's healthy, but not just staying in the comfort zone? Thank you for the very expansive question. Uh, and I have to think about um, one, you know, yeah, a lot of the work, the political work comes from trauma. Yeah. And so sometimes when we're so caught in trauma, it's hard to do like self-care. Yeah. So it's like, what does that balance between self-care, trauma, and political action look like? Right. And how can we co-create space to address those intersectionalities, right? So I think one of the things is showing up, yeah. Um, Hawaiian rapper Punahele has a great song called Show Up, yeah. And he just won a Nahoku Hanohano Award, yeah. So yeah, write that down. Um, and I think, you know, it's really important, yeah, to, um, to engage in the various conversations around the different movements. You know, as a student, you know, I'm a Hawaiian student, uh, or Kanaka, OUV from Hawaii, and I went to school at the University of Texas uh, as an undergraduate. And one of the things that I made sure to do was get involved in all the different, as many different kinds of student activists activities as I could. So I was in the Palestinian movement. I was like with Mecha. I was with the black students, you know, and uh, queer students, queer students of color, like just as much, um, um, what do you call it? Because education is key, right? And part of the education is actually going to the community, right? Directly. It's not necessarily like learning from vicariously, but the people, going to the people, yeah, because Queen Liliokalani, like our queen, her, one of the things she said was, you know, the voice of the people is the voice of God. So for me, when I meet people, I'm meeting God, yeah. And so, like for me, it's so critical to be involved in all the different movements because as we noted earlier, we're all connected, one planet. This is all we got. This is it. So why are we not going to connect with all the, as many earthlings as we, as we can, <laughs> you know what I mean, to address the trauma together and try to make it better, 
for the next generation, right? The seven generations rising. That's what we got to do. So mahalo nui for that question. Hi, aloha. I just wanted to uh, thank you all so much for sharing all of your ike and your mo'olalo and your stories with all of us. Um, I, can, I feel like I can speak for everyone watching that we truly, truly cherish everything you're sharing with us. Um, just, uh, I know when you're doing, you know, when you're organizing, you talked a lot about how trauma has helped fuel the fire. But on the other side of that, would you mind sharing a story of when um, you, know, so you helped someone in the community and they said, thank you so much. Like my life is truly changed or, or you saw uh, something, something that was like, oh, right, this is why I'm in it, to get people from the trauma to ourselves, to get people from the trauma to paradise, beauty, whatever, love. Um, so if you could share a story, that would be lovely. Mahalo. I don't play professional soccer anymore, but when I did, I struggled with like, what am I doing to help make this world a better place? I'm just playing sports and kicking the ball around all day long. And in hindsight, I had more people at that time in my life than I do now, but also I, I didn't really comprehend at the time how much of a difference I was making in kids' lives and adults too, queer people. I was one of the first athletes or soccer players that came out and identified as a lesbian in 2013. Wow, you know all the stats, <laughs> very impressive. <laughs> She's a fan, I love it. I like that I still have some fans. <laughs> yeah, so I, I did that and I had so many young kids come coming up to me and they just said, thank you so much. I feel like someone understands me. And sometimes it was just a quick autograph and a two second, like, hi, look in each other's eyes and acknowledge each other. And yeah, I, I had that moment over and over again. At first it was queer and then it was talking about my mental health and bipolar disorder and then sexual harassment. And it like I said, when you tell your truth, that's where you connect with people and people appreciate you. And yeah, I think the more we do that, the more people will turn to us. But that is a, it's a very important part of my life is really those just moments with individuals because we can work, we're all working, right? Organizing for social change to change systems. But there's something so special about that individual acknowledgement and just eye contact, looking in your eyes and saying, thank you. I'm just going to add on to that too. Um, that's a, uh, sorry, that question just made me realize why I'm here. <laughs> I've got to be honest with you. I was like sitting here. I'm like, why am I here with these people? <laughs> these brilliant people. I'm like, I just sing these sad songs <laughs> and I don't know what I'm doing, but I just realized with that question that my music is the movement, um, especially here in Hawaii. Um, I'm out. I'm gay. I'm proud of, of it. I went through so much stuff to be comfortable and to be who I am and to be able to get up on a stage in Hawaii, which is kind of closeted conservative, by the way. Like, everybody is so, like, it's crazy here. Like, I get scared sometimes being in spaces with other musicians in mainstream because I'm like, I want to express myself. Like, I've always looked up to, like, Mariah and Beyonce and, like, I looked up to them, but, like, I want to be them. Like, I want to wear dresses and I want to look cool and I love that stuff and like I want to sing songs about loving men and I don't want to be afraid of it you know so but I also want to do it from my own indigenous standpoint and and my understanding of how my culture is and who I am in my culture and so um sorry I just had to say that that question made me realize why I'm here um but also it is very rewarding to get the feedback that you've affected somebody directly through your organizing, through my music, um, I have people that will come up and tell me, you know, it is really, really rewarding for me to hear someone who is a listener of my music and they'll say stuff like, oh, I really love this song and the lyrics in it really affected me and touched me this way. But I have to say that some of the best feelings that I've gotten from feedback have come from other artists in Hawaii who have been like, I saw you on TV 
And I just was like, bro, this guy's doing whatever he wants to do. I'm going to do the same thing. And like, there's this kid in Kauai who had just opened for me last night, um, JP. And he told me that. And I honestly, I cried because I just was like, that's why I, I did it. That's why it's, I wanted to do it. It was because when I looked around as a kid growing up in Hawaii, I didn't see anybody who was gay or who was out. You know, there probably were a lot of people who were gay in the music scene when I was growing up, but they weren't out. And so for me, as a musician here in Hawaii, that's my goal is to be like, yeah, you're gonna know I'm gay. And I don't care if you know. And like, I'm, I wanna change that in Hawaii. I want people to be like, it's okay to sing about men if you're a man. If you're a woman, sing about a woman. Let's just sing about love. It is what it is. And that's kind of, thank you for that question. Yeah, mahalo. That was, my spirit is just overwhelmed. Um, wow, I'm getting emotional right now. It's not too often we get to sit in these kinds of spaces. Um, not too often we get to be invited by. We're gonna be invited by a lot more often through the Legacy Foundation. Um, I'm just grateful. I think if you were at the Indigenous panel two weeks ago, it was magical. And I think this panel is, is just as magical, and I think the reason why it's magical is because people are willing to share of themselves and their spirit, but also because they know that this is a space where they can resonate, right, and like amplify. Um, so I hope you can join us in the next town hall that's gonna happen this Sunday and in future town halls. And if you're interested in planning something, you let me know because I wanna amplify your voice. Yeah, like the reason why I'm part of the board is not just because I think the board needs to be more diverse, but it's because I, I want to hear more of our stories. Yeah, and so if you have an event that you have putting on, if you're gonna sing at your next thing, I might hire you for my wedding. Um, there are just a lot of resources we have here. And so I just wanna say thank you. Mahalo to our panelists. Mahalo to all those joining us on Zoom and in person. Um, community is ongoing. Yeah, it's not just a, a one-time thing. And so we hope that you continue to engage with us and you continue to build community with us and you continue to move. Yeah, so mahalo everyone and have a great night. <laughs>